A Crimson Sky for Dying, narrated by the author, James R. Nelson. Chapter 1 Archie Archibald sat at his desk, trying not to listen to what was being said in the next room. He needed to finish the notes from his previous night's stakeout, and he had heard the conversation from the other room in one form or another many times before. Archie's boss, Frank Bigelow, was breaking the news to his client, Carl Dimitri, a pudgy deli owner in his mid-fifties, that Carl's suspicions were correct. His wife was having an affair. They had reached the point where Frank was showing Carl the photographs Archie had snapped the night before. Archie was surprised at how good they turned out. Frank made him use an old Polaroid camera while he kept the good 35mm Nikon for himself. Archie paused and cocked his head. This was the part where the husband either got very angry and started swearing, or completely broke down when faced with the photographic evidence. Archie put down his pencil. There it was. Hearing what was going on in the next room, he could picture Mr. Dimitri slowly pulling out his handkerchief. Archie grimaced. Just wait. Wait until Frank presents the poor sap with his overinflated bill. It had taken Archie about five hours to follow Mr. Dimitri's young wife and her muscle-bound lover to a cheap motel on Dixie Highway in Pompano Beach and to snap the required number of incriminating photographs. Archie knew from experience that Frank was about to tell his client that multiple stakeouts took place and at least 20 man-hours had been devoted to the poor guy's case. After another 15 minutes, Frank's office door flew open and Mr. Dimitri, clutching a handful of photos, stomped out. A few minutes later, Frank called out, Archie, come on in here. I've got something for you. Archie grabbed his notes, walked into his boss's office, and sat down in the chair Mr. Dimitri had just vacated. It was still warm. The smell of Draker Noor, Frank's favorite cologne, permeated the air. Frank waved a manila envelope in front of him. Today, November 7, 1984, is a day you will never forget. Archie's heart beat faster. Archie's heart beat faster. Did it get here? Frank handed him the envelope. Open it up and see. Archie grabbed a letter opener from Frank's desk and sliced open one end of the envelope. He pulled out an official-looking certificate. Frank beamed. There it is. Looks like you're now an official Florida private investigator. He stood up from the desk and stuck out his hand. Congratulations. Archie smiled and shook Frank's hand. Thanks, Frank. I couldn't have done it without all the experience I got working with you for the last few years. Frank stepped out from behind the desk. Let me show you something. Archie followed him out of the main room and watched as Frank pulled a key out of his pocket. He opened a door to an empty office space that was adjacent to their business. I rented this last week. I'm going to have them cut a new doorway over here. This will be a nice office for you. Archie stepped back, his eyes wide. Really? Frank slapped him on the back. You've done a hell of a job. It's about time you left that desk in the hallway. Thanks, Frank. Thanks a lot. Frank glanced at his watch. Come on, let's get some lunch. I'll drive. As they climbed into Frank's car, Archie asked, How about going someplace new this time? Frank laughed. What's the matter? Don't you like girls all of a sudden? That's not it. You know that. I do have a wife, remember? It's just that whenever we go out for lunch, we always end up at the Blue Gecko. He looked over at Frank. They aren't known for their wonderful cuisine. Frank punched him on the arm. No shit, and that's not why we go there. They got the best-looking strippers in town. I told you. That's where I met Dixie. Archie mumbled, yeah, you told me. That's my place, man. It's like walking into Cheers. Everybody knows my name. Frank glanced over at him. Quit pouting. I won't tell your wife we have lunch here. As they got out of the car, Frank stopped. What the hell is this? About ten people were marching up and down the sidewalk in front of the strip joint. They were holding signs that said, Clean up the city and make Lauderdale safe for families again. Frank and Archie made their way inside the club. It was just as Frank had said. Several of the patrons and dancers waved hello. As they walked to a table, a waitress brought Frank a double vodka tonic without even asking. Archie ordered a soft drink, hamburger and fries. Frank told her he'd have his usual, which was a Reuben sandwich. 
Several of the dancers made their way over to the table. Frank stuck a few dollar bills into their garters. Archie politely declined. He didn't have any money to spare, and even if he did, he wouldn't be handing it over to them. Frank looked over to the main stage and hooted and hollered at the woman who was gyrating around a polished aluminum pole. When their lunch came, it was all Archie could do to bite into the thin, tasteless burger. After lunch, Frank had another double. They stayed for a few more dances, and then Frank pushed his chair back. I guess we better get going. When they got back to the office, Frank said, It's 2.30. Why don't you grab that certificate and go home? Show that beautiful wife of yours what you got in the mail today. Archie looked at him. Uh, I'm not so sure she's... Frank interrupted. You're doing that Big Freddy's stakeout tonight, aren't you? Archie nodded. Which one? I'll be watching the till at the bar on commercial. Okay, go grab your license and get the hell out of here. As Archie was about to leave, Frank's wife pulled up in her beat-up red Mustang. She grabbed a bag from the front seat and waved at Archie to come help her. Dixie stubbed out her cigarette. Can you grab this bag and take it to the storage cabinet? Office supplies. You know where they go. Archie followed her back to the storage area, watching her miniskirt sway back and forth with no visible panty line. He wondered how long she had worked at the strip club before Frank had met her. Now she worked in the office as a receptionist. She was a pretty woman with a hard look about her. There was no doubt she had been a knockout when she was young, but it was apparent she had experienced a few hard years. As Archie was putting away the supplies, Dixie glanced down at the envelope he had set down. Frank tells me you got your certificate. Archie smiled. I did. Well, I hope you stick around for a while. It wouldn't be nice leaving right away to start your own business. Archie looked at her in surprise. What? Oh, no. I hope that's not what Frank's been thinking. Dixie pulled up the front of her low-cut blouse. It's happened before. On the drive home, Archie wondered what his wife was going to say when he showed her the certificate. Probably not exactly what Frank had in mind. As he walked into the living room, Elaine jumped up from the couch and put her finger to her lips. She whispered, Shh! Amanda's finally drifted off to sleep. Archie nodded. He motioned for her to follow him. Once in the kitchen, he wrapped his arms around her and gave her a kiss. She pushed back. What's that for? He waved the envelope in front of her face. I got it. It came today. She tried to read what was printed on the label. What is it? He pulled out the certificate. My license. I'm now an official private investigator for the state of Florida. She tried to look happy. What's wrong? I thought you'd be proud of me. She frowned. I am. I'm sorry. I I just keep hoping we're going to move back to Ohio. Now she pointed to the certificate. It looks like we're stuck here. Archie stood quietly for a moment. Were they really going to have this argument again? He said, stuck here? I can't believe you said that. Here we are in a beautiful state with palm trees and the ocean. A place where it never snows. A place where half the population of Ohio would kill to move here. And you, and you think we're stuck here? I was all excited to tell you about the office Frank's going to build for me. But I guess that would only mean we're going to be stuck here even longer. I miss my parents and my friends back home. I hate it down here and you know it. She ran out of the kitchen. Archie tossed the certificate on the table. I'm going to get a beer down at the Jenny Lee. Then I'm going to do another one of those stakeouts at Big Freddy's. He stepped outside and quietly closed the door. He didn't want to wake their daughter. Chapter 2 Paul Singletary pulled the blinds shut in his office at 1.30 p.m. as he did every afternoon. The bright afternoon sun bothered his eyes. As a kid, he hated being called an albino, but now he accepted his white hair and pale skin with pride. It set him apart. People remembered him. He looked around and smiled. The huge mahogany desk, the art, the sculptures, the photographs of him posing with local Fort Lauderdale dignitaries and state political leaders, they could call him anything they wanted. How many of those assholes owned an office building with a 25-foot gold bar rotating on the top? The buzz of the intercom interrupted his thoughts. Mr. Singletary, a man claiming to be your brother is on the line. Paul let out a sigh and stared at the box. 
All right, send him through. Hey, bro, I'm out. Got sprung this morning. I'm sitting in front of the bus depot in Pompano Beach. Can you come and get me? Paul drummed his fingers on the top of the desk. I thought you were being held at Stark, at the state prison. How'd you get back to Pompano Beach? Billy laughed. After five years, I earned enough dough in the woodworking shop to buy me a bus ticket when I got out. You only had enough money to get a ticket to Pompano Beach? No, man. I had a ticket for Fort Lauderdale. But the thing is, I was sitting next to this knockout gorgeous chick. Hey, it's been five long, lonely years since I even seen abroad. I guess I got a little overexcited. She complained to the bus driver and they threw my ass off the bus. Can you come and get me? Where is it? Billy looked around. West Atlantic. Next to a bowling alley. Paul flipped open his appointment book. Yeah, I'll be there in about an hour. The bus depot was a small room tacked onto a bowling alley in a rough area of Sample Road. Paul smiled when he saw the look on his brother's face as he pulled up. He motioned for him to put his cardboard suitcase in the back seat. As Billy climbed into the car, he said, A Bentley? What in the hell are you doing driving a Bentley? It's a long story, Billy. Let's get out of here. Five more minutes around this dump, and they'll have jacked up the car and run off with my tires. Paul stomped on the gas, and they flew down the road toward US-1. Billy ran his fingers along the wood trim. No, come on, man. Where'd you get this ride? It's mine, you dumbass. I told you business was doing well. Billy looked at him. There's doing well, and there's doing well. I had no idea. A lot's changed in five years, Billy. You remember the tallest building downtown on Broward Boulevard? Yeah. Well, now it's mine. His brother shot him a look of disbelief. Come on. Paul smiled. That's where we're headquartered. World Gold Distribution, Inc. Billy shook his head. Shit, why didn't you tell me about this? Because the guards listen to every damn word you say when you get calls and visitors. Probably tape it all, too. I don't need anybody from the state poking around my business. And besides, things have been happening so damn fast, whatever I told you a month ago would just be old news by now. Just as they approached the Fort Lauderdale city limits, Paul pulled the car into a parking lot and slammed on the brakes. Come on, let's get a cup of coffee. He met Billy in front of the car, grabbed him by the arm, and marched him up to the front door. Billy tried to pull away. Shit, Paul, what's the hurry? There must be some damn fine coffee in here. As they entered the restaurant, Billy turned to his brother. What the hell is this? Paul burst out laughing. It's a topless donut shop. I didn't want you to see the sign while we walked in. That's why I rushed you up here so fast. Come on, let's grab a seat. Billy watched in amazement as a pretty young woman walked up to the table. Her huge breasts bounced with each step. She handed them both a menu. Hi, Paul. Looks like you brought a friend with you this time. Paul gave her a big grin. Yeah, this is my brother, Billy. She glanced at him and then turned back to Paul with an inquisitive look. Paul waved his hand. I know. He looks a little rough. He's, He's been away. When I get him all cleaned up, you won't recognize him the next time we come in here. They ordered coffee and donuts. As the waitress walked away, Paul leaned over to the table. Her name's Gentry. I've been trying to talk her into working for me at the reception desk. Can you imagine seeing her when you walk into the lobby? Billy shook his head. Damn, how'd you ever get any work done? She's gorgeous. And those boobs, what are they? They gotta be at least a double. I know, I know. She's amazing. She also sings in a band. I think she had them pumped up for her gigs. Every time I ask her to come to work for me, she just laughs. Hell, I give her a $20 tip almost every time I come in here, but she won't change her mind. A few minutes later, Gentry returned with their order. Billy was staring at her with his mouth open. Paul kicked him under the table. So Gentry, when are you going to quit this place and work for me? I'll pay you a hell of a lot more than you're getting here. She poured them both coffees. Oh, Paul, not this again. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm working here because the hours are flexible. I'm trying to finish my master's degree. I can't be tied down to a 40-hour work week. I'm real busy with the band and studying. As she stepped away, Gentry turned and looked at them over her shoulder. She winked, but thanks for thinking of me. 
Billy squeezed his donut as he watched her disappear into the kitchen. Finally, he turned back to his brother. You're right, man. Things have changed. On the other side of town, Archie sat in the Jenny Lee bar and ordered another beer. A bright shaft of sunlight pierced the dimness as the front door opened. Archie looked up to see Luther Johnson walk in. He waved. Luther stood there for a while, blinking, and then slowly made his way over to the bar. Archie had first met Luther here almost a year ago. The way you crept over here, Luther, I'd swear you got your eyes shot out when you were in the Special Forces. Luther ran his finger through his afro. Hell, man, I couldn't see a thing. It's so bright in here. When you step in here, it's like going to the movies. He called the bartender over and ordered a beer. What are you doing in here this time of day? Archie laughed. I could ask you the same thing. I'm celebrating, he said with a smile. I got me a job managing a small strip mall down on Andrews Avenue. Which one? The Palms on Andrews. Archie slapped him on the back. That's great. But what about you? Archie frowned. Had a fight with my wife. Another one? Yes, and it was over the same damn thing. Archie took a sip of beer. She just hates Florida, doesn't she? Archie nodded. It never seems to change. I was all excited because I got my private detective's license today. The boss let me off early so I could go home and show her. She wasn't happy with it. She saw it as just another reason we'd be sticking around Fort Lauderdale. Luther shook his head and lifted up his beer. Damn. Well, congratulations on your license. Archie glanced up at the clock behind the bar. I've got to head over to Brig Freddy's on commercial in a few minutes. I'm going to be eyeballing the bartenders to see if there's any skimming going on. He grabbed his bottle and finished his beer. Mind if I come with you? Maybe I can help you out. Keep an eye on things, too. Archie threw some money on the bar. I got your drink. Well, that would be great. I'll see you over there. It took Luther a while to catch on to what Archie was looking for. But before the night was over, he had spotted two bartenders he thought were skimming from the till. He pointed them out. And after Archie watched them for a few minutes, he confirmed Luther's suspicions. They spent the next two hours working all three levels of the huge bar. Archie yawned. It's been a long day. I think we've done our duty. You picked out two and I've spotted three. That's enough work for tonight. A warm breeze was blowing off the ocean as they stepped out of the club. Archie grabbed Luther by the arm. Can you believe this? Luther gave him a puzzled look. What? Look, palm trees. Smell that? It's night-blooming jasmine. How could anyone not enjoy living in a place like this? Dixie handed Frank a drink. What's wrong? You look upset. It's the kid. I hope he doesn't decide to leave. I got the Big Freddy account now, and I need his help. He's a good worker. Frank looked up when he didn't get a response. He saw his wife staring out the window. What's going on? Did you hear a word I said? I did. I heard it all. I'm watching an alligator swim down the canal. It's got something in its mouth. Frank got up from his recliner and walked over to the window. It's a Muscovy duck. That gator's been hanging around here for a few months now. I should get my gun and shoot the damn thing. She laughed. Yeah, you do that. Every cop in Pompano Beach would be here wanting to know who the hell killed the gator. Frank walked back to his chair. Damn nuisance. Wait until some kid gets pulled into the canal. They'll shoot the damn thing then, but it'll be too late. <laughs>